So hello and welcome to How Redlock Automates Security on AWS. Uh, my name is Henrik Johansson. I'm a Principal Solution Architect and Content PM for Amazon Web Services. And I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. In addition to um, this, we will also hear from Richard Vega, who is the Cloud Security Engineer for Redlock, and David Sao, who is the Global Information Security Officer for Viva System. On today's agenda, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the security on AWS in general, um, how it works and what to expect. We're going to talk about Viva Systems and uh, how AWS Cloud Security works for them, and uh, going on to Redlock, Cloud Threat Defense. And we're going to finish off with a Q&A and uh, open discussion on uh, cloud security. And a little bit on the learning objectives, what we hope that you will get out of today is demystify the shared responsibility model and understand what that means for you as a user and customer. We also want to um, give you a brief understanding of what tools AWS provides to help you meet your obligations from a security perspective. Then learn from Viva Systems about how uh, other key um, about other key security considerations you should be thinking of. And finally, get a demo of DevSecOps in action and how it works in real life. <clears throat> so starting off with uh, security on AWS. Uh, before we start, I want to want you to take a, a couple of seconds to think about what are your perceptions on cloud security today. What are the challenges that you see, and uh, especially the possibilities? Uh, what benefit do you get from moving your workloads to the cloud from a security perspective versus some of the challenges that you had on an on-prem environment or other um, type of platform? Stepping back from that, we look at a little bit why is the security traditionally hard? There are two main items that have a number of different um, challenges associated with them. The first one is lack of visibility. It's being able to see everything running in your environment, understanding what each server is doing and how those um, uh, servers talk to each other. And having the visibility to know when someone is doing something that might not be suitable to do. It could be anything from changing a setting in the network to just adding another server. So if you think back to your the, the old days where you had that server under the desktop, that is one thing. But what happens when someone adds another server that might not go out through the external firewall where you don't have any kind of traffic monitoring? Now you have resources internally that have access to the other systems uh, where you don't have your top proper monitoring, you have no visibility into what that server is doing, um, and just being aware of how your environment is configured and set up. It also allows the visibility directly into the resources um, on how they're configured, not on your own resources, but on the resources from AWS, where you can see centrally how each and every component of your AWS uh, infrastructure uh, is configured from a secure perspective. The second piece is the automation challenges. It's having the tools available without having to spin up and implement all the different uh, management and automation tools out there, and having these kind of tools available as managed services so you can take advantage of the same tools that another company that has already done this journey uh, is doing on a daily basis. So stepping back to security in general. So at AWS, cloud security is job zero. The benefit of that for you as a customer is that all AWS customers benefit from a data center and network architecture that is built to satisfy the requirement of the most security sensitive organizations. That means that even if you're a customer with uh, two employees and just started up your company and, and are shooting for those 10 million users, you have the same benefits from a secure perspective that the customer that has already been running on AWS for years and have a very well established secure organization, they know what they're doing. And you get to take advantage of the same secure benefits. You get to take advantage of the same tooling without having to uh, implement a lot of different changes yourself. And just by taking a, um, looking at what we have available as managed services or what we have available as partner services. So before you take that journey, one really important thing to understand is the shared responsibility model of AWS and the cloud, uh, security in the cloud. So we split this up into two segments. We have the responsibility for security of the cloud. This is your compute resources. This is your storage on the infrastructure side. This is the database and networking, all that is running in our data centers, in our different regions, in our availability zones, or in our edge locations. So this is the actual physical pieces of the cloud. We take care of the data centers. We take care of the perimeter security, making sure that we have separation of duties on who can access what, uh, making sure that there is a need and a um, requirement to, for every action that we take. These are the pieces that we take care of globally. You don't have to worry about who is managing your, your physical server. We will do that. The other piece of the puzzle is the responsibility for security in the cloud. 
this is the actual data, and this is where you as a customer comes in. And you're responsible for the customer data, aka the, the uh, information that you put on the cloud. Uh, this also includes the actual platform and application running in the cloud. So this is your operating systems, your network and firewall configurations. And it doesn't matter if the firewall is a firewall running on top of your instances that you installed yourself using an agent, or if you're using a security group to shield off any unwanted traffic. All of these uh, kind of configurations fall on your responsibility. While we provide different kind of tooling to help you with this, you are responsible for actually doing the configuration. This also includes things like client-side data encryption or data integrity authentication. So knowing where it's stored and how it's stored and making sure that when you put something in the file servers or on the servers or in uh, our uh, managed services for storage like S3, you're responsible for choosing and, and making sure that the data is encrypted at rest. Uh, this also includes network traffic protection. So making sure that anything sent over the network is encrypted when it's being sent and received and making sure that no one can see the traffic if they were to sit on your instances. And this is only if you were to sit on your instances. And finally, it also includes identity and access management and how you authenticate, how you make sure that the person who says, uh, who's trying to access your system actually is that person. Anything from using multi-factor authentication and, and hardware tokens to simply uh, identity and access using username and password, tying that into, for example, your Active Directory or using the AWS IAM services. So looking at the shared responsibility model, uh, we're going to do a little bit of pop quiz here, and uh, you do not need to answer in the chat function, but think about, if you look at the different scenario, whose responsibility is this actually? So for example, configuring the security group rules that determine which ports are open on the EC2 li uh, Linux instance. So who's responsible for actually configuring those rules? Same thing with preventing packet sniffing at the hypervisor level. We can move on to patching the operating system with the latest security patches. Shredding disk drives before they leave data center. Uh, secure internal network in the AWS data centers. Or installing a camera system to monitor the physical data centers. Or toggling server-side encryption features on for S3. And if you look at the different responsibilities here, you can see that anything that touches your operating system, anything where you have system access, falls in your responsibility. And that means, for example, configuring the security groups that you need to secure your actual EC2 instances. You need to patch your operating system. And you need to, uh, for example, configure which type of encryption you want in your storage. We do take care of, for example, preventing packet sniffing at the hypervisor level. Uh, we've already done that using our, our virtual network. We also handle, for example, shredding disk drives before they leave a data center and making sure that nothing leaves with any kind of data on it. And this is very important to understand, especially with the, the release of more services where we might um, you might think that we take more responsibility. Again, we have the responsibility of the underlying infrastructure, and you take care of the data that you put on there. Looking a little bit at the different services we have available, you can see we have a, a different kind of identification for the, the different services. We have, for example, our networking services. We have our encryption services like KMS, Cloud HSM, Identity and Access Management, and a different kind of compliance services like Config, CloudTrail, CloudWatch. All of these are made available to simplify your journey to the cloud from a security perspective where you can easily use these services in any kind of environment, and it's simple uh, configuration. We take care of the infrastructure, you take care of the actual configuration. We also, from a compliance perspective, um, again, giving you the same benefit, no matter if you're a small customer or large customer, provide you with the same kind of uh, regulatory needs or compliance reports. So for example, if you're just starting up in the cloud, you will still get that ISO report. You can still go in and get the SOC report directly from AWS Artifact, where you can download it yourself. Um, we also have a number of regionalized uh, requirements. So for example, C5, uh, if you happen to have a German requirement for, for C5 or Cyber Central Plus in UK. So whatever your needs are, um, I highly encourage you to go in and take a look at which kind of um, attestations or regulatory needs we already meet uh, with our cloud workloads. And it all comes down to defense in depth. How do we want to secure our services from an um, end-to-end perspective? What kind of tools do we have available? And what is it that we actually need to do? For example, we need to harden our armies. We need to set up IAM roles for EC2 and use IAM credentials. In the same time, we also need to have, for example, encryption at rest and actually secure our data stored there. Uh, we want to make sure that if any data comes out, it's not going to be in clear text. 
And the same thing applies to encryption in transit. We don't want to have anything sent over the network without it being encrypted. So looking at a couple of the new services that we released and how they map to this, we have, for example, Macy. And Amazon Macy is a service that uses machine learning to identify sensitive information and help uh, automate security and compliance. What it basically looks at is the challenges that we had. So for example, what data do you have in the cloud? Where is it located? How is it being shared and stored? Uh, what PII and PHI is possibly exposed out here? And the thing with Macy is that there's two parts of it. One is the um, <coughs> excuse me, natural language processing, which allows you to understand the actual data, understand what kind of data you stored. Is this a Word doc? And also, is this any kind of sensitive information, like, for example, addresses or credit card information? And then we also have a predictive user behavior analytics that looks at what kind of access are you looking at? Um, how are users accessing your data without it being a risk? So for example, is someone accessing normally accessing data every um, on a Tuesday between these hours versus now someone is accessing it on a Friday and downloading all your S3 libraries? So that kind of user behavior analytics. The other one is a service we just released called Amazon Guard Duty. And Amazon Guard Duty is really about finding the needle in the haystack. Um, it's taking advantage of the information that is provided using, for example, uh, VPC flow logs and network traffic and CloudTel data and DNS logs to see what is anomaly and anomalous behavior in your environment. What is uh, behavior, for example, when a new server that you never used in a region that you never used, or taking advantage of the threat information we have and receive from different kind of sources and quickly give you that information out through a simplified UI. And this is also one of the easiest services that you can enable. It is literally going in saying that, yes, I want to enable Guard Duty, and it instantly starts collecting and analyzing the information you have available. And the main sources it looks at is Cloud Chill Events, VPC Flow Logs, and DNS Query Logs. And then um, using MI, uh, ML and AI to detect different kind of anomalous behavior and give you that information so you can take action either directly using um, AWS Lambda, or if you're using partner services that can take action for you, where you don't have to go in and write these kind of systems. And quickly looking at a couple of the, the uh, benefits of it, uh, the pieces that I definitely want to highlight is it's no agents, there's no sensors, there's no network appliances. It's all using the information available in your cloud today. Uh, it's an easy one-click activation with, uh, without any need to uh, architect anything or have any kind of performance impact. We also have a number of resources available. So we have our cloud security um, information, and we have um, security resources and our security blog. And this is where we can provide information so you can continue to understand how, for example, the shared responsibility model works. And also understand that even though we're releasing new services like Macy, like Guard Duty, that doesn't change anything from a, a shared responsibility model. You are still responsible for taking action on these threats. You are still responsible for uh, taking action on when you find a, for example, an S3 bucket that is open to the world with PII. And the most important thing is that security is a service team. It's not a blocker. Security is everyone's job. So you need to allow flexibility and freedom, but you need to control the flow and the result of it. And we also have Viva um, Systems. I want to hand over to uh, Richard and David to talk a little bit about how Redlock and Viva has solved these kind of challenges on their end. Thanks, Henrik. I appreciate the introduction. Um, you know, really great slide so far. Uh, David, you know, David Sow is, is a valued partner of Redlock, and we've been working with him for a little while here, a uh, heavy user of AWS, um, and he's going to bring you through, you know, some of the strategies and tools that he uses to uh, formulate a security strategy for Viva and, and Viva's partners. So take it away, David. Great. Thank you, Rich. Hi, everyone. So here's the uh, standard Safe Harbor slide from legal. We won't go through this in much detail here at all. And I wanted to first give everyone an overview of Viva, since not everyone may be familiar with what we do. And so our mission is to provide uh, solutions for the life science industry, which is really the pharmaceutical, medical device, and biotech space. We have a fair number of customers, and we are publicly traded as well. I just wanted to set the context to that. As uh, you can expect with many other industries, we have a number of customers that continually look to us to secure their data while we store it in the cloud. We also have a fairly comprehensive security program, and I'll touch upon the main components around how we're managing our security within AWS. 
from a product security perspective, we'll look at how we are migrating into AWS some of the risks that we were facing and uh, how one of our key products have adopted new security controls within the AWS ecosystem and what that security stack looks like. From a migration perspective, we have been in AWS since 2016, but we are in the process right now of moving the rest of our production workloads into AWS and looking at the uh, learned experiences from other cloud customers and some of the failures that they have experienced primarily around resource misconfigurations or compromised access keys. And certainly, as you can see the Gartner quote here, that this is expected to continue. We were very concerned that we wanted to ensure our environments would remain secure as we went into AWS. So with that in mind, taking a look at the standard shared responsibility model, we realized or understood that there were three new capabilities that we really had to build out that was above and beyond what we were already doing in our existing uh, hosting environment. And the three components covered how Vivo would manage network traffic and network configurations, how we would manage user activity within the AWS console at the infrastructure layer, and how we would also secure and manage the various AWS resources that were uh, exposed. So examples would be EC2 and S3 and some of the services that Hendrik had also mentioned today. And when we take a look at how this applies to our security stack, so at the very top level, the application host layers those controls were already in place in our existing infrastructure. So we had our runtime web application firewall, we had our host security, but as you can see here, the network traffic and the other two were really the new capabilities that we had to build out. So this is where we've been leveraging a number of services to help give us, as an example, at the network layer, better visibility around flow logs, suspicious traffic detection, it's coming from a combination of Redlock, and we were also a a beta customer of guard duty for this. At the privileged user activity level, we had originally tested out a number of open source tools like Scout2 to look at the uh, permissions and what the users were performing within AWS. And ultimately, we found continuous monitoring through a commercial solution that will help not only identify uh, misconfigured permissions, but also potentially uh, malicious insider activity. And then lastly, at the resource configuration layer, there's certainly a compliance perspective of applying best practices from the CIS benchmarks, but also ensuring that best practices as a whole are followed since services are continually being released, as you've seen, from AWS and other providers. So how does Viva ensure that we not only are able to adopt these new services, but do so in a secure way? So this is where we are still relying on a number of third-party providers to help give us that visibility. And lastly, we have essentially funneled the events from the entire stack down into our security monitoring platform. And because this tends to generate additional alerts, we've also been leveraging security orchestration tools as well, as you can see from Demisto. So in summary, we found these were the three new major capabilities that Viva had to manage as we migrated into AWS. And we also wanted to integrate the alerts and the events with our monitoring and orchestration systems just to help streamline the response. So instead of generating alerts, we're able to automate the creation of you know, tickets and so forth. And as new capabilities are being offered in AWS, we found that there were a number of powerful open source tools. Of course, typically it does require a fair amount of uh, resources to configure and deploy. And ultimately we settled on a number of commercial solutions where we primarily relied on the typical trusted advisors and security consultancies to help identify what those solutions are. And so that's all that I have. If you have any questions, you feel free to send me an email. Otherwise, I will turn this over to Rich. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. So I'm going to bring you guys through a couple of slides here, uh, and then we'll dive directly into the demo, uh, and we'll cover some uh, really cool stuff on how you know Redlock automates security through um, you know, similar methods in terms of, of um, the machine learning algorithms you see uh, with Macy. So excited to kind of bring you through some of the parallels there. My name is Rich Vega and I'm a cloud security engineer uh, for Redlock. Happy to be here today presenting to you uh, and thanks for taking the time. A little bit about Redlock before I, uh, before I jump into the technical details. Uh, we were founded in 2015, uh, headquartered in Menlo Park, California currently. 
Uh, we're backed by uh, Dell Technologies Capital, Sierra Ventures, uh, Storm Ventures, as well as a few uh, other angel investors. Uh, you could see we're also protecting about 5 million resources uh, for a number of partners and customers uh, in the Redlock network. So I know we've went through this. We went through this about uh, twice now with Henri Henrik as well as uh, David, but you know, I really want to kind of drive home uh, where Redlock sits in terms of, of the uh, responsibilities that you have as an organization. So you can see the cloud service provider, you know, as, as we learned a little earlier, uh, is responsible for uh, really the on-prem infrastructure uh, and the hypervisor that supports all of our AWS workloads, right? Where the organization's responsibility comes in uh, is what we do with this, this wonderful service that AWS provides to us, right? So we need to look at resource configurations, user activities, network traffic, hosts, as well as applications, right? And today I'm going to show you how Redlock protects you from the host layer all the way down to the resource configuration layer, right? And, you know, just to draw a, a parallel to, to Henrik's slides on Macy, um, you know, Amazon Macy is an incredible step forward uh, in utilizing machine learning algorithms uh, for behavior analysis and, and data interaction. At Redlock, we've held this view, uh, you know, that we align to that mindset uh, and we try to deliver that and, and we do deliver that really at the infrastructure level. So as I'm going through here uh, in the demo, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, a lot of the user behavior analysis is, is very uh, useful and, and can be utilized at the infrastructure level as well as the data level. So let's dive into the demo. All right. So. The first thing I want to show you guys, and today in, in the Redlock uh, 360 dashboard, you know, is the account setup. It's important to note that Redlock is completely API driven and API based, so we uh, we don't need any agents or proxies installed on your accounts. Uh, and while we are multi-cloud, you know, I myself uh, am a AWS uh, preferred user, but you know, uh, we do support uh, AWS GCP as well as Azure. Um, for this example, let's use AWS, right? I'm going to enter a test account name, webinar test. And you can see here, the only thing that we really need from you is a read-only access account um, within your public cloud environment. So once we've created that, we'll just enter the AWS account ID, the external ID, and the role ARN, right? Once that's added, we'll be prompted at a status page, and we can see that the account will be added here, in which we can disable and enable it. Now let's talk about policy guardrails. Right. I think it's important to understand when we're adopting, you know, public cloud at, at, a, at an agile rate, uh, you know, companies are going to want to set guardrails uh, for their uh, users' activities and, and understand, uh, you know, what they want out of a security program, right? So a lot of that uh, includes compliance frameworks, right? Uh, so we tie back to quite a few compliance frameworks. We have some PCI, HIPAA, uh, CIS, and uh, NIST on the horizon there. Um, but just want to note that we have about 75 plus out of the box policies, um, you know, and they cover everything from configuration monitoring uh, to network traffic to event audit events, uh, you know, anomalous behavior at the infrastructure level, right? Interactions with uh, access keys and, and resources. And then we also uh, provide the ability to create custom policies, uh, you know, for your particular organizational need. Uh, so if you have a unique policy that you need to set, uh, or you know you need guardrails that you need to establish uh, you can do that as well on the subject of compliance uh, we can actually generate a compliance report for outside business units uh, you know or internal resources to be able to to view uh, what's going on from a compliance standpoint right so you can see I've produced the CIS compliance report and I've opened this up and I can go to the executive summary and I get a, a pretty good summary of uh, uh, of my compliance posture um, you know, within my accounts that I've added to the Redlock platform. So all of these are tied back directly to section, uh, sections of the compliance framework for CIS, uh, and we can actually click in to each of these, get more details, uh, and then if we'd like, we can actually click in, go directly to the alert, right? So really powerful way to kind of deliver information throughout your organization and business units uh, from a, a, you know, a security standpoint. Now I'd like to take you to the dashboard where we're going to take a look at some of the, the main analytics, uh, you know, that provide uh, a really good view into your infrastructure, right? Um, Redlock starts by classifying your instances by role. 
Um, you know, our algorithms are, are designed to, to work within, you know, an hour to three hours of, of that read-only account being established, uh, in which time, you know, we can see what instances are interacting with other instances, uh, you know, kind of what the role is within the org, within the org right? Um, you know, then we move on to the bottom right corner where we see uh, risk rating by scanned accounts, right? This is important to, to kind of take note of because, uh, you know, I think it's important to understand where your highest risk is, um, you know, so you can really drive uh, your efforts and kind of focus focus in on those those first. Uh, so we created this this risk rating system, uh, which allows us to kind of drill down from A, A through F uh, on the severity and riskiness of, of these particular accounts. So you can see here, I've bubbled up to the F category, uh, and Developer Sandbox has about 41 resources with that F rating. Uh, so keep that in mind as we go through. Uh, you know, we're going to look at a couple of resources in a minute here, um, and I think it's you know good to note that we see quite a few resources with the F rating, right? Moving on to the top policy violations in the bottom left-hand screen, uh, you can see you know we have quite a few top policy violations here in the last month. Uh, but I'll I'll take a look at suspicious traffic from the internet, right? So important to note for this policy, <clears throat> we're actually looking at suspicious traffic from the internet uh, that you know, and that that kind of entails anything communicating outside of a web server, NAT gateway, or or an elastic load balancer, right? So something communicating directly out out to the internet. You can see we have a list of violated re violating resources. Um, you know, all of these resources in this case have an F rating. So, you know, this, this is a, a situation that we could definitely investigate. Uh, let's choose MongoDB, for instance, and hit investigate, right? Now, this is where, where Redlock, you know, the visualization engine and, and kind of the machine learning algorithms uh, behind the scenes allow us to uh, produce this visualization that, you know, I don't think you'll really be able to see anywhere else. Uh, you know, from my knowledge, this is uh, the only platform that provides this sort of visibility. Um, so, you know, starting from the center out, uh, you know, we have the suspicious IPs marked here, um, you know, communicating with our resources uh, within AWS. Uh, and it's important to note that the, the information we're, we're gleaning here uh, is actually taken from the threat intelligence feed uh, that, that is directly connected to the platform. Uh, you know, so we're constantly updating suspicious traffic um, and suspicious IP uh, notations to make sure that we have the most up-to-date threat intel. Uh, you know, on your environment and what, what's communicating there. So uh, let's take MongoDB, for instance. You know, we see some directional traffic going outwards to MongoDB. So let's click the traffic. And now we can investigate, you know, what protocol that traffic was, was uh, delivered over. We can see the traffic volume. And we can see, in this case, that traffic was accepted, right? So now we have a suspicious IP that has transmitted traffic to our MongoDB instance, right? And we can see that that was accepted. But maybe I want to get a little more detailed, uh, you know, on what's actually communicating and when when this uh, volume was occurring, right? So we can see on the connection details screen, uh, you know, the traffic volume graph up here, and then on the bottom we can see the suspicious IPs uh, that we've gleaned from our threat intelligence feed. Uh, so you can see here we have some Korea Telecom as well as some China traffic, right? So uh, you know, maybe we're not expecting that, uh, and in this case they've actually been uh, reported for uh, brute force attempts, right? So our threat intelligence feed has let us know that this particular IP has been reported for brute force attempts, and, you know, that's kind of what we're seeing uh, on the SSH side of this instance. So, uh, you know, to investigate further, we click the instance itself, and we get an instance summary. We get the resource ID tied directly to MongoDB. Uh, we get the roles and groups that we've gathered uh, the classification on during that uh, initial um, data kind of read. And then we see the IP addresses associated with this instance, as well as the tags, the VPC name, the account name, and the, and the region in which this uh, instance lives, right? Drilling down a little bit further, we can see a network summary, which gives us the security group configuration, um, which in this case, you know, we have a quite loosely configured uh, security group here in the form of a, a wide open port 22, right? So just to tie it back, uh, you know, and kind of put it in perspective, right here, just with MongoDB, I've showed you, we've, we've gathered intelligence from a threat intelligence feed 
that tells us that there's suspicious communications over SSH to this particular instance, right? We've I, that's one violation. Uh, we've established that the security group associated with this instance is loosely configured, right? That's two violations. And then on top of that, you could see in the alert summary tab, we've integrated AWS Guard Duty as well as Tenable I/O um, and a couple of other third-party uh, vulnerability scanning feeds. Um, you know, Amazon Spectre is also native in the platform. Um, so we have a couple of uh, additional alerts uh, that add to the severity, right? So let's take a look at AWS Guard Duty alerts first. So we pop open the tab and we can see that Guard Duty at the host level is also confirming that we're seeing brute force attacks, right? As well as a number of other uh, alerts on the page. But the important piece here is that we've now validated at the host level as well as the infrastructure level, uh, you know, that there is in fact a brute force attempt uh, from these particular IPs, right? And I believe this is the one uh, that we were looking at earlier. So, you know, it's really important to correlate all of this data uh, into one, you know, kind of single pane of glass where you can take a look and you can give your teams access to, to drill down and investigate, uh, you know, all of these incidents, right? Um, Another thing that we really need to, to keep in control of uh, as we scale, you know, in public cloud and AWS <clears throat> is the changes that occur on the instances, uh, you know, that we bring up. So you'll see again, there's that F rating for MongoDB has about, you know, has three or more violations here. So we can see it's, it's still categorized as an F. Uh, and, you know, really in the audit trail, we can see everything that's been updated uh, since the discovery of this particular instance. So you'll see here the resource state, you know, the tags were changed from Viswatenable to MongoDB, right? So this may be a warranted change, but definitely something to, uh, to keep in mind, you know, configuration checking and, and kind of audit at the configuration level is very important, uh, you know, with, with a high, highly ephemeral um, environment, you know, within a, a public, cloud, uh, public cloud infrastructure. So the one thing, I'm, the one more thing I'm gonna bring you through here today uh, and, you know, probably the most exciting uh, is, is really the, the user behavior analysis piece, right? Uh, Henrik talked a little bit about it during uh, his, his, Macy, um, his Macy slides. Uh, you know, and Redlock really uses uh, machine learning algorithms to detect unusual behavior within your environment, uh, you know, at the infrastructure level. So if somebody is touching, you know, a service that they're not normally touching or they're doing something that they normally wouldn't, uh, you know, we're going to alert you to that. Uh, and that's important, you know, uh, that we understand uh, the baseline of normal activity within your environment. Uh, so that that is a, uh, you know, a 30-day learning period uh, in which, you know, Redlock really gets an understanding of what each resource is doing, uh, what, it, what uh, objects interact with it, and, you know, really what users are doing within the environment. So you can see here we have a, a violating resource. Let's take James, for example. Uh, we'll see that we can see that James has on the left hand side a set of usual activities that we've observed him doing uh, within that learning period, right? He generally acts as S3 and IAM for a service for services. In the resource category, generally he's interacting with access keys and buckets, right? And he's doing it from Santa Clara, California or Menlo Park, California, right? Pretty common activity. On the right hand side, we'll see a list of the suspicious activity that the Redlock UBA has picked up. And you can see here that he's now interacted with EC2 as a service. He's doing something with instances, right? So this is definitely a red flag. And he's accessing it from Sao Paulo, Brazil, right? So, you know, in these two examples, we're seeing a activity-based anomaly as well as a location-based anomaly uh, that Redlock has detected within, within your public cloud computing environment, right? Now, to take a, a better look at what James has done, uh, you know, maybe it's harmless or, you know, maybe he's mining a whole bunch of Bitcoin, right? Uh, we want to drill down and see exactly what the user James has been doing, right? So in this graph, we'll see a, a, bubbles, a, a bubble graph in the, term, in the sense of services and then when an action was, was uh, triggered. So in this case, we see 14 suspicious activities on October 18th. Um, and you know we're uh, we're alerting you because this may be a potential access key compromise, right? So in the case of of you know uh, companies who 
who uh, who won't be named uh, <laughs> during this presentation, right? Uh, you know, access key detection at this level and anomaly detection uh, might have you know increased the uh, or I'm sorry, sped up the time to detection uh, on a lot of these access key kind of scrape and scrape and go uh, situations, right? So we can see here that James, you know, has been terminating instances left and right. Uh, clearly, that's the activity-based anomaly, right? And then we saw, uh, you know, he's performing that from from Brazil. So he's running instances, terminating instances, and you could see a full list of all the things he's doing, right? Logins, deleting buckets, right? But the important thing to focus on is the anomalies in which we've picked up on. Uh, you know, he's created a security group. And, and done quite a bit of other uh, activity within this AWS account. So, all right. Just to wrap up and to tie back, you know, Redlock really uh, creates a common language between the partners we're working with uh, and, you know, trying to establish a, a, an effective security program with by uh, showing them this maturity model and really getting an idea of where they sit within it, right? Um, I think we've shown you a couple of things today uh, that, you know, really prove that, that Redlock is the only tool currently uh, or platform currently that supports you through your adoption stage all the way to your scale phase where you're adopting multiple cloud providers, thousands of workloads are in play, uh, and you need to still kind of keep that central architecture visibility. And again, you know, this is fully API based, uh, so, you know, providing uh, providing us access with a read-only account, uh, you know, we get that set up and then we, we start to ingest data and uh, baseline that user activity and we see results immediately. If you're interested in, you know, kind of the things we've talked about today, event-driven security, uh, you know, near real-time security and just ensuring that you keep your public cloud uh, infrastructure uh, secure and you have full visibility, you know, feel free to reach out to us uh, at redlock.io. For, uh, for a risk assessment, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing the, the things that we see, uh, you know, just with that, that kind of snapshot point in time of, of what your entire public cloud is doing, right? So I appreciate everybody joining us today, um, and I'll, I'll kind of give it back to, uh, to Henrik here to finish out. Thanks, Richard, and uh, thank you so much for that demo, seeing how we can use Redlock to, to help <clears throat> implement a proper DevSecOps practice and, and really utilize the, the information that's being available uh, when working with cloud workloads. We'll see a uh, question here. Um, and I'll actually send this to, to both David and Richard, um, since it's a little bit open question. So what is the most interesting finding uh, that your cloud security intelligence team has found since you were brought on board? Um, and I'm happy to take both to uh, Richard and David on that one. Uh, yeah, uh, I can speak to that. So couple of things that, you know, really I think uh, were, you know, top of mind for me and really interesting was uh, that our, you know, our CSI team, uh, you know, we found quite a bit of uh, Bitcoin mining going on, um, you know, on, on kind of publicly exposed instances, uh, you know, uh, across multi-cloud deployments. Uh, you know, that was kind of a big, for me at least, you know, it was a big light bulb saying, you know, we really need to kind of keep our visibility at a maximum uh, when we're kind of confronting these challenges, right? It's not always about stealing access keys, not always about kind of brute force. Sometimes it's just, uh, you know, stealing your compute resource to mine Bitcoin. So good, kind of a good, uh, interesting fact uh, for, for 2017. Thanks. Another question there is, is, what do you think is the most important for organizations to have in their security programs going into 2018? Like, what are the challenges that you see with uh, customers right now, and, and what should they be focusing on? Yeah, uh, I could take that one as well, David. So, um, in terms of uh, going into 2018, I think it's clear uh, that the stage has kind of been set for, for the machine learning, you know, the machine learning age of security. I think it's important to have uh, you know, reactive and proactive controls in place, you know, that aren't humans clicking and clacking away at a keyboard uh, to, to really be able to stand up against the, the threat landscape that, that exists, uh, you know, with public cloud. So, you know, general visibility uh, of your assets, I would say, is, you know, a base kind of a, a table stake and really starting to align to all these compliances is, is really starting to become the, 
the low bottom level of, of security and uh, you know it's 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 only going to get more challenging so I think embracing automation and you know even if it's just for intelligence gathering and uh, you know remediation either, you know however you incorporate it into your strategy I think it's important uh, that you do have you know automated automated solutions uh, you know when we're dealing with event driven security thanks and and I absolutely chime in on that as well saying that automation is is really important from a security perspective and both from um, making sure that you have a, a accurate response every time something happens, but also sort of removing the human uh, and delays that um, human interaction will have on uh, sensitive actions is really important. And, and making sure that you scale accordingly as well. Uh, it's very hard to scale human interactions to um, to the, the sort of the, the scale that some of our customers are running and uh, uh, instead of switching to automation and using, like you said, using the machine learning information that comes in um, instead of trying to find that needle in the haystack yourself. Hi, Hendrik. <clears throat> this is David. I wanted to add into what uh, Rich mentioned. So I certainly agree that between automation and orchestration, that'll have significant benefits to dealing with the large amounts of data that we'll be getting from our systems. Also, suspecting there may be a convergence between uh, the user behavior analytics and network behavior analytics. We're starting to see that already with you know Guard Duty and, and some other solutions, as well as Redlock, to combine the sources of data to not only look for the initial investigations, but also to do uh, further or deeper uh, data science, kind of the, the advanced analytics and correlation. So it really just depends on, on where each customer is in terms of their maturity and in, in going into these cloud providers, but do you see that as being the next kind of evolution of, of maturity? Absolutely, and, and um, we definitely see more and more more and more customers looking into how they can take advantage of that kind of information that a find a needle in a haystack is, is a common term but but uh, using the stream of information that's coming in and making sure that you eliminate all the noise and just focus on the actual findings and and evaluating how critical and how realistic those findings are yeah and just to, just to add on to that Henrik you know I think uh, you know you kind of sparked my my light bulb here I mean I think you know it's definitely uh, one thing to to kind of have the intelligence and have the controls in place, uh, you know, but it's another thing to have that in a kind of a single place that you can view, uh, you know, at a different, you know, business unit level, you know, so going forward, I think, you know, you'll agree as well with Amazon's, you know, thousand, thousand plus features they launched this year, um, quite a few of them were surrounding security. Uh, and what it comes down to is being able to integrate and easily, you know, externally send out or, or uh, absorb these different disparate data sets uh, you know into one place so that you can funnel that appropriately uh, throughout your organization. Thanks. So we have one question here um, and I'll um, answer as well and shoot that out. What would you say are ideal certification for DevSecOps teams nowadays uh, speci specifically for cloud protection considering there are so many different InfoSec certification programs? I'll, I'll forward that to you too, David Rich as well. I would say from my personal opinion, um, there are a lot of good certifications out there um, that you can take um, to sort of show your, your uh, understanding and, and knowledge about the space. It's also very important to, to focus on what are you actually pushing out there and how are you um, sort of, what are you creating to help the industry? What are you creating to share information and knowledge? Um, so a lot of focus on anything from open source, especially in the DevSecOps community, but focusing a little bit on open source information and sharing the knowledge and the experiences that you have, uh, but also sharing information through, for example, presentations at, uh, at conferences, uh, public events, making sure that you, you sort of provide that feedback back to the community as well. Uh, but I, I want to sort of ask David and, and uh, Rich as well, what, what, um, what do you see on the certification side um, for cloud protection and for DevSecOps teams? and InfoSec teams in general? Sure. <clears throat> so this is David. I, you know, I would say from a certification perspective, that's kind of the, the table stakes. It's foundations that you would expect your resources to have. It, well, and, and I would even take a step back as, and go so far as saying certifications should not be the emphasis. I think that they're useful to have in terms of vetting uh, candidates, but ultimately you know, having hands-on experience in a cloud environment, especially because it changes so quickly, is, is much more valuable. and. Uh, I would say, from my perspective, the most important thing is, is less around the, the certifications or the skill sets that 
you may have on your team, and it's actually more important to be able to test and verify whether the uh, DevSecOps tools and services have been properly implemented. So huge believer in offensive driven defense and whether that's through third parties or having team members play the role of an adversary to continually probe and test, that's really the only way to confirm whether or not things were built and configured correctly. Yeah, yeah, no, and just to piggyback on that, I definitely agree with you, David. I think, uh, you know, the ability to you know, one, prove that you're, you're certified or you meet a particular standard uh, definitely is important, you know, and, and kind of being able to do that regularly without a long process, uh, you know, entailing, uh, you know, multiple departments, multiple, you know, very long documentation sets, right? I think it's important to be able to do that dynamically as needed so that you can adjust and pivot uh, correctly, you know, and that's kind of to use it as an example, uh, you know, Redlock, uh, we utilized our platform to get our SOC compliance, right? And, you know, it's one, it's one thing, uh, you know, to, to get your compliance, but it's, you know, it's another thing to get it with, with your own platform. And I think that that in itself, you know, is, is really kind of the, the message that we're trying to send is that it's a dynamic ephemeral cloud, right? And if you're not keeping up with the changes and aggregating these things in one place, uh, it's very hard to prove that you, you, these certifications. So, you know, in, in our sense, we, uh, I don't like to say we ate our own dog food because that's disgusting. I like to say we drank our own champagne, right? So definitely make sure that you have uh, tools and, and programs in place uh, that allow you to effectively and quickly uh, identify your weak points in your, in your uh, certification process or any of your compliance frameworks in general, right? So I guess the key takeaway for the TLDR would be, uh, you know, make sure that you're always visible and make sure that you can dynamically produce results uh, based on what you've seen over the last quarter, over the last three quarters, right? Thanks. Thank you so much for that. So I, I'd like to thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. And thank you so much, to David and Richard, for presenting. Uh, it's very inf um, informational information. Thank you, Henrik.